there and welcome to Cutler Corner. I'm Representative Josh Cutler, proud to represent the 6th Plymouth District representing towns of Pembroke, Duxbury, and Hanson. On this month's show, we have a great guest uh, with us, Davenport Crocker, who is the president-elect of the Plymouth and South Shore Association of Realtors. We're going to have Thank a discussion you. about uh, the real estate industry, which is a big part of the South Shore. South Shore. So welcome, Davenport. Thanks Thank for joining you. me. Thank you, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Now, just briefly, give us a little bit of your background, uh, you know, professionally and, and, and uh, personally. How would you get to this point? Sure. Well, um, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, president-elect for 2014 for the Plymouth and South Shore Association of Realtors. So uh, very excited to be a part of the, the our local realtor association. Um, I've been around real estate for a lot of years. My mother was uh, first licensed back in 1978. And like a lot of people in our business today, uh, I'm, I'm considered a legacy. Uh, I followed in her footsteps. Uh, she was good enough to take me to open houses when I was 10 years old. I uh, learned the Should business. make you work? She did. She actually sat me down at a card table and uh, I used to sign people in, get their oh, phone number. Okay. She paid me a dime for every phone number and name that I collected from people attending open houses. Okay. Uh, I soon learned that Is I that could Is that good charge. money then? It was good money in 1978. I, I will say I actually collected 25 cents to take coats. And uh, so uh, once she found out about that, she uh, she put the kibosh on Did you on. get a bonus if they actually bought the house? I didn't. I didn't at the time. I that held off for that. That wouldn't have been okay <laughs> underneath the license <laughs> laws. So uh, I became licensed. My myself in 1990. I worked with my mom for a short period of time in 1990-91. I then uh, followed some other uh, interests, got into some uh, some other things, was out of real estate for a number of years, got back in, in um, late 1998 down in Maryland and uh, moved back in uh, late 2002, early 2003. So I've been here right. ever since. And you work uh, at Colwell Banker? I'm part of Colwell Banker. I work in, um, in our management. Uh, I work uh, out of Waltham, Massachusetts, but uh, help to oversee and and run our offices in southern Massachusetts and, and now Rhode Island as well. So you cover a pretty pretty big area. I do, I do. It's exciting. This is a fantastic business, and uh, uh, I oftentimes joke about uh, how I got into the business, but I take it very seriously. It's been great. I, I've loved real estate, and, and that's why I'm here today. And uh, so you, you would wrap some of my towns, Pembroke, Duxbury, and Hanson, although absolutely, uh, you, you would cover all those towns. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Okay. And Pass, which is the sort of what you guys call right. your your group, uh, Plymouth area, right? Plymouth and South Shore. Plymouth and South Shore Association Realtors. Okay. Uh, Pass is a lot easier on the tongue. So. It is, it is. Uh, we comprise our uh, area that we cover with realtors is uh, actually 18 South Shore communities. Uh, okay. Braintree and Quincy all the way down to Plymouth, uh, Carver, Plimpton. Uh, I won't try to name them all because I'll forget That's some, right. Weymouth, Cohasset, <laughs> Hungham. As long as you remember Pe Pembroke, Duxbury, Pembroke, and Hanson. Pembroke, Hanson, <laughs> Duxbury, uh, they're all in there. So it's, it's well, So what is the purpose of PASS and its large So business our sense. realtor association is, uh, is responsible and, and works directly with our realtor membership to support them in uh, in this business. Um, interestingly, very quickly, back uh, the turn of the last century, uh, that's when the National Association of Realtors came into into formation, and, and it really started in Chicago um, because at the time real estate was being sold out of barber shops. There were no license laws across the country. There were no uh, defined ethics uh, that people lived up to. So, local associations grew out of that, and uh, in the state of Massachusetts, it's, it, the MAR, the National Association of Realtors, started. 1936. That predates our license law in the state, uh, which didn't come into effect until I think 1957. So realtor associations have provided education, training, uh, ethics, uh, dispute resolution, um, marketing and, and technology tools to realtors. Uh, it's also a support mechanism for buyers and sellers because it's a place that they can come to when they have problems uh, with realtor members. So it's a phenomenal organization, does uh, very well. We've got about 2,400 members across the South Shore uh, communities and, and uh, it's fun, to, great honor to be a part of the uh, association. How, what was your secret for getting like the president? Uh, well, I don't know other than uh, showing up and participating okay. and uh, and I feel strongly about the the uh, the role that we get to play uh, in our in our industry uh, but also on behalf of buyers and sellers and you know we can talk a little bit about some of the things that we're we're proponents of mm -hmm. um, you know there is no uh, lobby on behalf of homeowners <laughs> um, but realtors do uh, fill that gap to some degree uh, we see issues across not just a small community but across many communities the state and nationally where we can help play a role in in having an impact on the things that 
that really do affect the kitchen table in everyone's homes. Uh, yeah, so. and I, I want to talk about that. I have a quick question. Um, it's just an issue that uh, I was always curious about. What's the difference between a real estate agent and a realtor? A realtor actually so, has a, is a proper name, isn't it? Right. Correct? So, so a realtor is someone who belongs to a realtor association, okay. and real estate uh, licensee is someone who has a real estate license. In the state of Massachusetts, currently there are about twenty thousand realtor members. Uh, okay. uh, as I said, in Plymouth and South Shore Association, we have uh, about twenty four hundred members. Um, there are a lot of people that have real estate licenses, but mm -hmm. then there's a smaller group that have uh, decided to join an association. In many cases, it means that they've expanded their education level. Uh, they adhere to our code of ethics. They participate in ongoing training and, and learning about the latest mm -hmm. tools that can help support them in their business. Uh, as I mentioned, it also provides a framework for uh, dispute resolution, which does occur every okay. once in a while. So, so it's, more, it's, more, it's a professional organization, whereas the real estate agent is a... Is a it's just a licensing it's a license issue. So Absolutely. could you be a realtor without having a real estate license? Or? No. Uh, realtor membership is uh, is only for real estate okay. licensees. There are, uh, within most associations, we have now affiliate members, which are um, other companies sure. that would like to belong uh, to participate in the process. Uh, but individual members are all real estate licensees gotcha. in the state of Massachusetts. Okay. It sounds like one of those analogy questions on the SATs, but yeah. we won't go there. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you know, legislating, and you guys recently had uh, a visit it to a day on the hill, as I call it, uh, up on Beacon Absolutely. Hill. It's a right. very Tell important part that. of our calendar. Well, as you know, uh, being there. Yes, I got to be there, yeah. <laughs> got to be there the, this year, uh, and congratulations to you, Thank by you. the way. Um, Realtor Day on the Hill is an important uh, component of, of what we do locally. Um, we also go to Washington uh, every year, mid-year. We go travel to Washington to meet with our national legislative uh, representatives, both the Senate and, and congressional members. Now, and I saw, then, I don't mean to interrupt, but I saw yeah. a picture of you, and I have to diverge here for a second. Yeah. I saw a picture of, of you uh, or your organization meeting with Congressman Keating, yes. our, our congressman here for this yes. area. But I also just happened to see on, on the front cover of, uh, perhaps uh, our folks can, can see this, on the front cover of the, the Password, which is the monthly or newsletter for PASS, yes. a picture of uh, six young women on first blush, yes. but on closer inspection, it looks like that's you dressed in drag as Marilyn Monroe. Is that? Is that well, tell us about uh, that. Well, uh, <laughs> in all candor, uh, Congressman, the the uh, the reality is that that is uh, that has been uh, identified as me. So I, I can't dispute <laughs> that. Uh, this was a, a great fundraiser. Um, one of the other things that we do on a local level as an association is try to give back to the community. Um, this was a fundraiser that was going to the uh, Situate uh, has a Sands, uh, a, a, an emergency relief uh, organization. Organization. And this was a way we raised money. Uh, there was a comedy section of this, and then there were Johnny a Turco, of us. who's a really funny guy. I've had him in my events before. Phenomenal. He's great. He's Phenomenal. Great. And then we had a number of us dressed to help collect money. And uh, as I, I would point out, I did win the the uh, the beauty competition uh, to my wife's chagrin. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what did your wife think when you were judged the most beautiful woman? She wasn't woman? pleased. She wasn't pleased. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. And, uh, so I, of course, uh, didn't think this would get out. But of course, uh, in the age of social media, it was all it's on the front. So. <laughs> yeah, so. It was all for charity, though. So it was all for it good. Was for charity. Good for you for doing it. It was. So. And uh, we've retired that outfit, so uh, that was a one and only. All right. Well, we'll retire this as well. I just I felt like I had I had to bring that up. I appreciate it. So <laughs> back but, to the beacon. But beacon uh, yeah. day on the hill is a great opportunity, and as you know, it was a great opportunity for us to come in. We got to um, our keynote speaker was Attorney General uh, Coakley. She spoke yes. about uh, the real strength and power of home ownership in the Commonwealth. Um, home ownership is a big driver of the, the economics that make every state work, especially in Massachusetts. And, uh, and then it was an opportunity for us to come and visit with each of you and, and share some of our uh, thoughts and concerns about legislation that you are currently and, and in the future taking in consideration. And, and so we don't uh, necessarily uh, speak individually on those things. We speak more as an association, as what's what's in the greater good of what we see for home ownership, and um, and that's a that's a great thing we get to participate in. Uh, it's not necessarily individually what any one of us might feel, but it's as an association, as as we represent 
our communities and our homeowners that live in those communities. It's We have that voice, we love to come. And as you know, uh, that particular day, there's literally hundreds of realtors running yes. around the hill. Uh, it's fun for us to uh, to participate and, and see what you get to do on a daily basis. Sure. sure. No, well, we like having the visits too. So, so it's, it's good for us. Nice uh, both all around. Now, one of the things, uh, there's a number of pieces of legislation that you all are you know, advocating for. One, as I recall, had to do with continuing education for realtors. Can you Absolutely. tell us about that one? Absolutely. So education has always been uh, a great uh, divide, uh, divide uh, mechanism between um, different levels in any profession mm -hmm. um, and in and in every profession that we uh, that we know of there's ongoing education and it's the same in the in the Commonwealth we have uh, an, a every two years every licensee is required to renew their license within that uh, regulation there is a stipulation that they have completed 12 hours of continuing education coursework and there's a broad spectrum of courses they can choose from but this helps to keep the licensees uh, knowledge Mm -hmm. uh, in the current inner workings of real estate. Uh, so that's an important component. Across the country, um, in many states uh, that we've studied, the level or the number of hours uh, required is quite a bit higher. And uh, certainly as realtor members, um, we believe that increasing that to a minimum of 20 hours would actually um, allow us to have greater responsibility to maintain the highest levels of professionalism. It's not, uh, and, and there are people that dispute this. There's some people that say, well, this creates a, a, a more challenging barrier. Um, I, I strongly disagree with that. I think that 20 hours of education over uh, over 24 months um, is not a very high barrier to get over. Two years? Two years. Oh, I see. Okay. And uh, I think, candidly, um, in your profession, in all professions, I think that ongoing education is, mm. is critical for us to maintain a very high professional level. It's not, though, just for realtors. This would be for all licensees. So we've asked that and, and asked for support uh, of you and others uh, in that bill. And this is for folks who already have gotten their license but to Absolutely. continue to keep the license. Absolutely. So you actually, you know, I mean, more power to you. You're taking it upon yourself to, to have a higher standard for your own profession. It's, well, and essence. again, I think that we all see um, the... Uh, we're all judged, just like in, in many industries, we're all judged typically by the least amongst us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a challenge. That happens, unfortunately, uh, in my uh, business as well. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll refrain from commenting. Uh, I think that, that you, I'll let you, you comment mm -hmm. on that. The, the fundamental piece, though, is that I think through better education, through more education, we raise the bar. And the, the real winner in that are the buyers and sellers, the consumers who in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are really, um, uh, there's a lot at stake. Uh, the home ownership is their, oftentimes, the single largest investment that they have. Mm. So if we can better educate ourselves in the process and help to uh, to avoid the things that could otherwise cause challenges and problems to that transaction, I think that that's a win-win for, for everyone. I, I don't see a downside to it. Great. Well, we're going to take a break in a second, and we're going to come back. I want to talk about, uh, we talked about off camera, um, issue of foreclosures, which are sure. thankfully uh, we're seeing some good news on that front Absolutely. and some other uh, areas just in general in terms of the, the, the market in general. But uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, you're watching Cutler Corner. I'm Representative Josh Cutler and we'll be right back. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. Welcome back. You're watching Cutler Corner. I'm Representative Josh Cutler. With me again is Davenport Crocker, uh, President-Elect of the Plymouth and South Shore Association of Realtors. Right. We're having a discussion about the uh, real estate industry. And I want to talk about an issue we mentioned before the break, uh, foreclosure rates, which are, uh, we're hearing good news about that. Tell us Absolutely. about what's Absolutely. going on. So most of the most recent statistics that we have access to, uh, or that I'm aware of, uh, run through, the, through May of this year. And, and comparatively, year over year, uh, foreclosure uh, foreclosure off 69% year over year in the, in the 69? Commonwealth. 69? 69%. I think it's a little over 
1,200 foreclosure uh, transactions um, in the first five months of the year, which is uh, no foreclosure, I don't think, is good. Um, uh, there are some that are going to occur. Uh, and that's a really positive uh, development. Mm -hmm. um, that's obviously driven by very strong economic uh, uh, success in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, it's also uh, driven in, in part to some, some legislative initiatives. In the state of Massachusetts, we have uh, regulation that really uh, tightened the reins on uh, some of the lending institutions mm -hmm. and required them uh, on a local level to not foreclose if refinance or if there were other economic solutions that made more economic sense, if that, make, if that yep. makes sense. And I think that's, that was a great way that, that, uh, that our legislature was involved in a solution that really has helped people stay in their homes and find other economic solutions. And uh, so I think that that's just a, a real success for us in Massachusetts. And I think that it's very encouraging uh, on a lot of economic fronts to see that number uh, dropping as much as it has uh, this year over last. Uh, it certainly is, is, is great news uh, for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the issues that uh, I know you uh, were bringing up during your uh, visit to the Hill was uh, something that's cropped up in, in some communities, not in, my, in our communities, but uh, the idea of a, it's called a transfer tax. Sure. I believe in Provincetown they're proposing this yes. and maybe some, some other communities. And I know it's a concern for some folks. Can you kind of w walk us through what the, exactly that is and what it would mean for, for your industry? Sure. Well, so as a realtor association, um, we, have, we have been strongly opposed to any additional cost added to the real estate transaction. And uh, if I could digress for just a moment, a lot Absolutely. of people see that and, and sort of the flip response to that is, well, but that, that may be a self-serving. And, and I don't I don't see it that way, and, and I uh, I take issue with people that, that take that short response. The reality is that um, the cost of the real estate transaction is borne by the sellers and the buyers in the marketplace, and so anytime we talk about adding a fee or or, <coughs> or a, a tax of some kind, and we can call it anything we want, but revenue is revenue. As soon as you start to draw out more revenue from the mm -hmm. real estate transaction, that's got to come from either the buyer or the seller, and in most cases, it's borne by the buyers. Now, one of the challenges of that is that the one of the largest groups that's now getting into home ownership are millennials. They are historically putting down, they have less access to capital uh, than almost every previous generation. So if we put a greater burden on them, we're going to be handcuffing the very generation that we're relying on to be the next group of buyers in our marketplaces. Uh, I think that it's a, a metaphor that I've used sometimes is that you know, the real estate transactions as a whole in the state of Massachusetts might make up a big pie. Um, well, there's filling in that pie. There are needs, and I think we're all cognizant of the fact that there's needs to increase revenue at the state level uh, and in small municipalities and towns and, and cities and towns. Um, that makes complete sense that they need revenue. But to, to try to take more pie filling out of the pie, if you will, uh, as a revenue stream is challenging. What I think we should be focusing on is how do we continue to build the pie, make the pie bigger, mm -hmm. so, uh, so that already the revenue streams that come out of that transaction can be increased. And that includes the state transfer tax. Uh, yeah, now, so, just could you walk us through that for sure. folks who may not be familiar? There is already a, a state transfer tax, There correct? is a, there is a straight, well, it's called tax stamps. So stamps. it's not a transfer tax, I apologize, it's tax stamps. And, and that's charged on every transaction, mm -hmm. and that's a percentage uh, that it's $4.86 per thousand. So when you cut into the home uh, prices, you're cutting into that uh, that stamp, the, the transfer stamps. Uh, so I apologize, I called it a transfer tax. It's not a transfer tax, it's tax stamps. But those stamps, that cost is driven by uh, the relative home values that are, mm -hmm. that are uh, 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 transferred uh, that buyers and sellers are agreeing to. Uh, when you start talking about adding uh, a draw of revenue out of the transaction, it will have an adverse effect on the amount of money that buyers have uh, to put into a particular transaction. That will keep a pressure on home prices to either keep them lower or mm -hmm. lower them over the long term. I think that's a, that's a challenge. So while we understand and acknowledge the need for local municip municipalities to find revenue streams, I think that the real estate transaction is one that that uh, they're starting to play with an engine that drives our, a lot of our economics. Mm. So I think that's a, I think that's a, that's not a good place to go. Sure. You mentioned uh, sales prices. I'm curious. So, 
uh, sales prices, I presume, are, are on the upswing. Uh, yes. What has been the the, uh, the indicators showing? So uh, showing all the indicators in terms of, uh, of what we've seen in 2013 are very positive mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to home prices. Um, generally, across the 18 communities that, that are part of, of Plymouth and South Shore Association, uh, we've seen um, on a on a broad basis. You can look at this in, in any kind of segment. You can look at June over June. So you can look at 30 days this year versus 30 days last mm -hmm. year, and you can see single-family homes have jumped almost four, over 14 percent, and that can be rather overwhelming. I think it, it bears that we also look at it a little broader and say, okay, over the first five or six months of 2013, what is the market born versus over that same period last year? That's where we see a little bit more modest increases, and mm -hmm. I think that's probably more accurate about where the market is. Uh, the year over year, we're running at about 7 percent increase in home prices through the first six months of the year uh, on the South Shore within your district uh, directly, uh, there's a little tighter uh, mm -hmm. uh, inventory. Inventory is, is down nearly 22% over a year ago. That's the number of homes that are actually homes that are on, for the sale. on the market. So that's good if you're a seller, it's great bad if, if you're, you're a buyer. Seller. It's challenging if you're a buyer. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so that must be something you're doing really well in your district <laughs> to keep that, that moving. What, right what, what, what creates that? You know, that, that cause, before, it was sort of the opposite problem, it seemed like. So it's always driven by I mean, buyer's, market, but buyer's demand. And okay. uh, communities on the South Shore have historically been very desirable. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know probably very well, the state of Massachusetts, um, we have a lot of very smart zoning regulations and, and, uh, and rules and laws and everything else that keeps development um, from, from uh, becoming a, an overwhelming uh, uh, component of what's going on in our marketplace. That keeps our inventory relatively low compared to the rest of the country. Mm. Uh, Massachusetts also has a very strong economic engine in that we're not driven by one uh, economic, uh, we don't just rely on education or medical or insurance or banking or, uh, or high tech. We have all of those things here in Massachusetts. So our inventory of homes is always lower than a lot of other parts of the country. That makes a very stable market. When we get into smaller and smaller segments of the market, so South Shore and even mm -hmm. Duxbury, Pembroke and, and Hanson, these are communities that are well served now by a commuter rail system that wasn't there four or five years ago. Um, the, these are communities that have very strong uh, uh, school systems and economics mm -hmm. within their communities, so that makes them very desirable for buyers. And buyers flock to where they find these things. Taking the inventory off the shelf drives prices higher. And why aren't more people putting, if, I mean, so the market is great, you know, people are, you hear that these people putting price, homes in the market, they're snapping up in a week, right. you know, that maybe not be the average, but why aren't more folks taking advantage of the market? You think it's just a, a, a lag or is it? Well, uh, there's always challenge, you know, every opportunity uh, has a challenge on the sure. other end. And, and so a lot of sellers today, while they may, uh, there are still some people that are, that are not out from underneath what they may have paid for their mm. homes. And so that's obviously causing them some sure. challenge. Additionally though, there are sellers that would like to sell today, and there may not be homes for them to move to. A limited inventory right, affects sure. uh, them as they look at selling. Um, a topic, and, and we've touched on this um, off air, but there's a there's a growing concern um, about baby boomers. Uh, not concern about baby boomers, but concern about what their impact might be on sort of a longer term real estate market and the health of our markets. And uh, the reality is they can't all, they're not all retiring at the exact same time. It's a, it bridges about a 20 year uh, span, a generational span. Um, they're going to be retiring for the next many, many, you know, a decade plus and, 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 and uh, actually 18, 17, eight more years of retirement for baby boomers. As they retire and look to transition into other housing uh, solutions for them, those homes will become available and that's why it's so important that we keep the accessibility at the at the lowest end for millennials and for Gen X and, and everything else. We want to keep the markets as stable for them because they're the ones that are getting into the market and uh, are helping to create stability over the long term. Now what, another big component of this is um, interest rates in the sure. Fed obviously and we've seen uh, some some upticks in the interest yes. rates. Uh, it seems like the last couple months have been fairly fairly volatile. Right. For, you know, as, as, as uh, economists might say, what do you see uh, in interest rates, and how is that affecting what your interest? Well, rate? Real, interest rates are always relative, and <laughs> you and I are young enough that I don't think either of us were purchasing homes when rates were up at 18, 19 percent. I, I can't fathom that. No, it's hard guess, to fathom. So yeah. we struggle now when rates go from three to four. Um, but the reality is that uh, it's still historically low. It's still historically low. Right. Um, the 
the, the, the Fed Chairman, uh, Bed Bernanke, did uh, recently, in one of his most recent uh, uh, conversations, he was very concerned about home ownership nationally as not slowing the growth of home ownership at that lowest level. Um, that's where there's a lot that, that you and also at the federal level, uh, I think we need to ask for, for real consistent and careful uh, hands-on approach to FHA, which supports the, the lowest uh, and, and is sort of the, the safety gap when, when everything else in the economics of the mortgage business collapsed, FHA was, was who stepped in and really supported the mortgage markets uh, through a lot of the downturn. The accessibility to, to, uh, to sound but, but uh, fairly easeable, uh, easy access to credit is the driver for the millennials and, and Gen X uh, population. They're the ones that are going to drive the markets for the next uh, generations and we need to make sure that they have access to credit. Um, upticks in interest rates Maybe maybe it stays up, maybe it comes back down again, but the long term we want to make sure that regulation makes sense mm -hmm. and that we don't overreact to uh, maybe a lack of regulation or poor decision making uh, during the sort of the heyday. Uh, we want to make sure that the regulations get put in place uh, make sense, uh, give people, uh, as I said, not unfettered or uh, overly easy access, but uh, sustainable access to credit. Is there a concern uh, among folks in, in your industry, you know, because the rates have been so low for s such a long time, relatively speaking, that we're sort of artificially creating that this this housing, you know, market may not may be somewhat an artificial creation because of sure. the fact the rates, you know, are, are just still so low, even four and a half percent. That's right, and of course that's being driven by the Fed is is still buying mortgage product right. at the back end. So um, there's always a concern, and and I think that that's why we have you and others uh, <laughs> at the state level and our our legislative uh, congressional delegation at the at the federal level. Uh, our hope is that by careful scrutiny and and careful. <coughs> Uh, modification, not over tinkering, but careful modification mm. of the things that are in place, uh, we can bring st stability to that. I think that what everyone would like to, to avoid is is a rocket ship ride. Uh, what we really want to see is sustainable growth, and that includes in the, in the equity markets for the more secondary mortgage markets. It includes uh, what goes on all across, as you know very well, with, with business development within the communities. With the, if you don't have business development, people don't want to move to the communities. That affects home value prices. So uh, home value prices derive property taxes which uh, allows us to afford the best schools and so it all hinges mm. together and I think we have to be very careful what we want to do is build a sustainable model that that uh, that doesn't just reward us for today but rewards us over the next decade two decades three decades for the rest of our generations what sort of um, trends do you see happening you know moving forward for the South Shore in terms of the real estate industry what, what's your put on your prediction hat well uh, I appreciate ahead. that question <laughs> I always avoid that question as best I can I think I think in the foreseeable future, we have a, a very large buyer pool that is still feeling a pent-up amount of demand. There's a need for building to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at, at um, our uh, construction, uh, the new new homes building, as a as a real area that we hope that that line of those lines of credit for them continues to develop. Um, the the Massachusetts housing report card last year actually said that we might need as much as 120,000 new construction units between 2010 and 2020. Uh, that's that's a very large number and we're building it below half that per, uh, uh, amount right now on an annual basis. That's a real concern. Are we going to have enough housing units for as businesses grow and continue to move people into Massachusetts, will we have the inventory to support that? Um, so I think that that's an area that we need to hopefully see some consistency in terms of, of uh, building and, and developing. I think that the, you know the, the governor of course has is, is taken on a lot of transportation initiatives mm -hmm. and those do have very sound, strong, long-term impact on our markets on the South Shore. We've certainly seen that with, uh, with the Greenbush line that, that uh, has helped to develop. And, and even though that Greenbush line stops in situate, that's had a dramatic impact on towns uh, like uh, Pembroke and Duxbury because there are people that live in those communities that sure. now ride that, that rail every we single day. We've got to get our, our weekend hours back. That's yeah, something I'm working on. Excellent. But uh, unfortunately, we're out of time uh, just about here at Davenport. I want to thank you so much for, for joining me. Probably could have done a whole hour about the uh, real estate market. but It's fun to get together with you, Josh. <laughs> and anytime you just let us know, we're happy to come down and, and uh, share anything we can. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. And I'm sure my viewers did as well. Again, you're watching uh, the Cutler Corner. I'm Representative Josh Cutler. Thanks for tuning in.